Thanks so much, Brett, and just for moving our hearts with, with that prayer. Sure. May the Lord hear our feeble cries and, and answer. Well, good morning. Um, again, it's just my privilege to have been with you these last six weeks, and uh, a joy for me to just spend this in-depth time uh, in God's Word. Um, so thank you for this opportunity. If you were writing Psalm 23, how would you end it off? I mean, just think back on where your journey as a sheep with the shepherd has taken you over your lifetime and where that journey has taken you through this psalm. I mean, you've been made to lie down in green pastures. You've, you've been led beside beautiful, refreshing, quiet waters. You've wandered off, and then your shepherd has gone and found you. He's brought you back. He's restored you. He said it's ongoing, present, continuous tense. He restores me because I keep wandering away, I have this bent to wander. We've then been led into these paths of righteousness, and then we've come to the scariest place of all, this gorge, this, this valley of the shadow of death, and we've been enabled to fear no evil because the extension of the shepherd's heart, arm has come to us through the rod and the staff, and we've experienced him there. And then he's led us up onto the tabletop, this mountaintop of summer grazing. And as we got there, we recognized he, he's been ahead of us and he's prepared this table for us. And he's come and he's laid a feast in the presence of our enemies. And we've recognized that our shepherd is even nearer than they are. He's come, he's anointed our head with oil, all those michis and flies and little irritations in life that get to us. He comes and he anoints us with his spirit, this buffer between us and the mosquitoes of the world. And then he comes and he fills those troughs to overflowing, unlike the hired hand who, who just shoes the sheep away and doesn't want to keep drawing water, but he keeps drawing, he keeps refreshing, he keeps nourishing, he keeps enabling us to experience the living water. And so having experienced all of this, where do we go from here? I think like a eulogy for a loved one, and I know some of you here have had to write that eulogy for a loved one when they come to the end of their journey. And you've said to yourself, how do I cram a lifetime with this person into letters and syllables and words? It almost seems impossible. And so David comes and, and how is he going to paint a, a painting that will be a fitting grand finale to all that we've looked at? I think David, if he could have, would have loved to have continued writing Psalm 23 on into the future. Because the truth of Psalm 23 continues to echo out into the future. But David knows as well as you and I do that this side of eternity, every earthly pen eventually runs dry. And every author's hand eventually grows weak and fails under the decay of time. And so David has to write something before it's too late. And he writes a far-reaching, into the future, all-sweeping, all-encompassing statement. And look at what he shouts out. Turn to Psalm 23 and verse 6. And you'll see it on the screen as well. He cries out, surely... Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You see, the end of Psalm 23 is actually just the beginning. It's just the beginning of forever. And so this morning, if the Lord is your shepherd, then there are certain things that will be true. And so I want to challenge you that you might not know the Lord is your shepherd, you might have been here all of these weeks, and I want to encourage you, maybe this morning at the end of the series, you need to come to the front. You need to invite somebody to, to pray with you, because you're coming not to a person. You're not coming for anything other than to meet with the Lord Jesus Christ, because these truths will only be true if you can say, this fountain, this source, the Lord is my shepherd of verse one, is true. Only then will these truths be true of you, right down in verse six. So these are three truths that David is going to tell us about our future if we are in Christ. Number one, my future is sure. My future is sure. There it is, right at the start of that verse. There it is, the front gate, the name on the gate says surely. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. How can David be so certain? How can he say surely? 
I mean, is David uh, somebody who's completely uh, sure that he is going to uphold his end of the bargain, so to speak? Is David just somebody who's attended some talk show host who said, rah, rah, David, you can do this. David, you can believe in yourself. And if you can believe it, you can achieve it. I believe I can fly. Whatever David would say. No. David's confidence is not in himself. He's not saying, I'm never going to fail all of my days. I'm I'm never going to be able to earn God's goodness and mercy forever. It's impossible. I can't. The whole of Psalm 23 has been screaming God. It's been screaming God, not David. It's been screaming shepherd, not David the sheep. David is a sheep and God is the shepherd. David is the one who wanders away and God is the restorer. David is the one who keeps going back to these parasitic infested puddles and pastures. And it's God who has to provide green pastures and quiet waters and prepared tables and overflowing cups. And David is a skittish sheep. He's afraid. He's all over the place at times, like you and I. And it is God who has to lead him. It's God who has to say, David, quieten down. God has to make us lie down. We won't lie down unless all of those things that we looked at are met. And then we will lie down in peace and security. David is a sheep. And as we've been saying, sheep can do very little to defend themselves. He cannot protect himself. He has to stay near his shepherd, the one who is strong, who has a strong rod and a strong staff to comfort and protect him. And so David knows he's the sheep, and so his certainty comes from Christ, comes from Christ, even though he has not yet met Christ in the gospel and through prophetic Messiah, the Christ will come. Matthew Henry says, David is counting upon the continuance of of God. He's not counting upon his performance as a sheep. It's the performance of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross that you and I trust in. God will continue to shepherd him. It's because God won't stop. It's because God is a God of forever that you and I continue if we are in Christ. God will not do a half-baked job. He will always finish what he has started. Jesus says in John 10, 27, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. It's not because we're so good at hanging on to God's hand and saying, look here, I'm not letting go. No, it's God that's holding on to us. Surely, surely my future is sure. Number two, the second truth about our future. David says my future is secure. There's obviously overlap. Surety and security are are two things that are very, very closely related. My future is secure. He says, surely goodness and love will follow me, will follow me all the days of my life. I've been watching on Netflix uh, that series that's been on for years called Forensic Files. I think it used to be called Medical Detectives, and I enjoy forensic stuff. Because I think at the end of a busy day where I haven't been able to solve everybody's problems, it's nice to watch something and see it all get solved at the end. But uh, it gives me a little bit of comfort. But I think I've been watching too many murders over the past while. It's kind of like, it's uh, affecting me. But um, nobody likes the thought of being followed. And in half of those episodes, and if you've got Netflix, there's 11 seasons with 40 episodes each. You'll be able to watch the horrors in the US uh, probably till the day you die. But... um, (laughs) These poor, poor women walking home, and, and, and it's amazing when you watch that, how many of the victims are women, walking home from a party, walking home from, from um, some events, you know, going out to the shop and going back to their, their dorm, and they hear these footsteps, and they look behind, and the next thing, something terrible has happened to them. We don't associate being followed with something comforting. It's, it's something terrifying. It's something horrific. And when we think about tourists that we've heard of that have been followed from the airport and they've come to our our beautiful nation and they've been followed to their hotels, a place of safety that they thought would be home to them and then they've been robbed of their jewelry and their valuables and sometimes even worse. And so the same risk is true of a sheep in our passage. A good shepherd knows that whenever he's leading his sheep home at the end of the season, so some shepherds might lead their sheep home every, every day, and others it would be an annual cycle, bringing them down from the mountains back to the safety of the, the flock, the, the fold at home. The risk 
was that as they were going home, a predator would be coming up behind. And we know the shepherd was out front leading. And so what if a predator, a wolf or something, came behind and there was a, a little poor lamb, uh, an injured sheep that was lagging behind? The risk would be great that they would become an easy target. And so it's very strange for us to read in Psalm 23, verse 6, that David is deeply comforted by being followed. Why is that? Well, our text tells us it's because he's not being followed by a monster. He's being followed by goodness and love. In some translations, mercy, it's loving kindness, it's chesed, it's the covenant word for God's love for his people, the special love. There's a general love for all, but there's a special love. He's being followed by goodness and love. And the Hebrew word for follow is so strong, the English doesn't bring it about. It is used normally of violence. Go and search it up in the Old Testament and you'll see it's about enemies pursuing people that they're trying to get. It's used of, of the Egyptian, Egyptians chasing after the Israelites as they go through the river. There's an intensity here. This is an enemy pursuing a victim. So goodness and love are not just casually in the background of our lives. God says they are pursuing us, they are chasing us, they're hunting us down. God has his SWAT team around us. He's launched his heat-seeking missiles to surround us. He's hunting me down with goodness and love all the days of my life. I think back to when I was a little boy and my gran in Cape Town used to take us to the park. As a boy, I was so excited, and so I would always run ahead of her, and she was always trying to keep up. And she'd say, Justin, you mustn't run ahead. Something could happen to you. And I'd say, Gran, nothing can happen to me. She says, well, why can nothing? Because you're always behind me, Gran. You're always behind me. There was a, a security. And if you and I can trust a, a feeble old Gran who can barely keep up with us, then surely you and I can trust a God who is hot on our heels with goodness and mercy, who's not only behind us, but in front of us. He's a shepherd leading out, and he's all around. He's omnipresent. An old Scottish shepherd that I found said something so beautiful. He's not a trained theologian. He's just a simple Scottish shepherd out in the field, and, and someone recorded what he said as a believer in Christ in such a beautiful way. We don't even know his name. He just said, what do I think of when I think of goodness and mercy? I think of the fellows, talking about the shepherds, maybe we need to try the accent. I think of the fellows taking the sheep home. That's a horrible Scottish accent. <laughs> the sheep are coming behind them, and behind the sheep are the two dogs. The two dogs. One is called goodness, and the other, mercy. Those puppies you've adopted, what brilliant names. Goodness and mercy. You watch them. Sheep are being what they are. When the shepherd's back is turned, they'll try and sneak off the road. You see a sheep on one side and off it goes trying to get back to the pasture and to the mountains. Without even the shepherd whistling, what happens? Goodness runs out and circles the sheep and turns it back into the flock and into the path of God. And then a little further along the road, another one will do the same. And there you see mercy running out and turning the sheep back too. Oi, they two lovely dogs, goodness and mercy, and a terrible accent. <laughs> it's just such a beautiful image. Goodness and mercy are personified in verse six. They are twin guardian angels. They are those bodyguards with the earpieces in, and you've got two of them, and they, they never let you out of their sight. These are the twin sheepdogs of God to secure our future salvation, which is not dependent on us, but on Christ and his commitment to you when he made you his own. And don't you think if he could love you as a sinner, what could be in you to make him stop loving you now when you do sin? If in Christ he's graciously given us all things when we were still sinners, then how much more will he graciously, along with Christ, as the Apostle Paul in Romans, give us all things? And what is goodness? Goodness is giving us what we don't deserve. I don't deserve blessing. I don't deserve all the things that God has given me in my life. That's what goodness is, giving us what we don't deserve. And love or mercy or loving kindness is not giving us what we do deserve. Are you awake this morning? So goodness is giving us what we don't deserve. 
all the blessing. And mercy is not giving us what we do deserve, which is judgment and wrath because we are at enmity with God because of our sin. And so God gives us goodness and he gives us love and mercy. He forgives us. So goodness gives us what we need to be able to follow God on a daily basis. We have everything that we need for life and for godliness. We can make no excuses. We can't blame the church. We can't blame our spouse. We can't blame anyone for why we're not growing as a Christian. We have goodness. We have everything we need for life and for godliness. And on this side, when we mess up and when we fail and we don't follow, then we have mercy to cover us over, to forgive us, to bring us back. And we need both of these things. We cannot have one without the other. And the link between goodness and love, goodness and mercy, is one of the most common themes throughout Old Testament worship. Here's just two of them. Psalm 100, verse 5. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. David, writing two psalms later in Psalm 25, says, Remember, O Lord, your great mercy and love. For they are from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you are good, O Lord. And I think perhaps the reason this truth doesn't shock us and stagger us and wow us as much as, as we should is because we feel so entitled. We've lost the, the joy and the, the, almost the first love of, actually, I don't deserve goodness and I don't deserve loving mercy. I don't deserve it. I'm a sheep. I'm prone to wander off, I'm fickle, I'm, I, I get dirty. I follow the crowd more than the shepherd. But if you've repented of your sins and you put your faith and trust in Christ, God's goodness and love will follow you all the days of your life. I met with a young adult this week in her early 20s and she was sharing with me how just a few years ago as a teenager, she attempted to end her life. She said to me, Justin, I wanted to die. This wasn't to seek attention. She said, I went to that medicine cabinet and I took out every single pill that I could find and I swallowed a lot of them. And it was only God's mercy and by his grace that she was found by her mother in time and rushed to the hospital and her life was saved. If she was to share her testimony with us, she would tell you that that was the defining moment in her life. Up until that point, she's not sure if she was a Christian. She prayed some prayer when she was a young girl. Maybe that was God's grace in bringing her back. We don't know. But in that moment, recognizing what she deserved, that's what she wanted, that's what she'd chosen, and yet God in his mercy and loving kindness had come and met her when that's not what she deserved is what melted her soul and ambushed her and arrested her. And that's what it's been like for me and I trust for you. Yes, God's discipline sometimes brings us back, but it's his discipline against the backdrop of even while he's disciplining us, he sometimes still gives us blessing, a blessing that we didn't expect and we say, Lord, in the backdrop of this, wow, oh Lord, you love me. You love your sheep. It's a mystery, but you do. But maybe you hear this morning and you say, Justin, I hear what you're saying but I think David had his head in the clouds. If you knew the suffering and the pain and the trauma and the tragedy that I've been through, I think David was somewhere up there in that cave smoking something, but uh, he didn't know what I'm going through. And I'd say to you, I think David did. He wrote this in his own valley. He wrote this in the midst of his enemies. He wrote this probably on the run. And I want to say to you, is there no goodness and love in a doctor who sometimes prescribes a bitter cure so that you would be healed? Is there no goodness and love in a father who sometimes disciplines his son to save him from greater punishment? Is there no mercy and love in a raging storm that's in your life because that raging storm is disturbing the stagnant atmosphere and blowing away the pollution so that the sun can shine more clearly? Of course there is. And goodness and love is marshalling you home. A home where the questions will be answered and all those dark shadows will be swallowed up by the realities that lie behind them. The light that is behind the shadow. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. 
Paul said in a Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this, there's the surely again, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is incredible that God will make sure that every single one of his sheep will make it safely home. And the question I have before I move off this point into our final point is why? Why on earth will God make sure that every single one of his sheep will make it home? Is there something so special about a sheep? What is it with us? What is it with our sheep-like creature? Why would God bring us home? J.R. Packer, in his book, Knowing God, writes something that every time I read it, it still arrests my soul, and I've read it to you before in other series. This is what he says to answer that why question. If a father continues cheerful and carefree while his son is getting into trouble, or if a husband remains unmoved when his wife is in distress, we wonder at once how much love can there be in their relationship. For we know that those who truly love are only happy when those whom they love are also truly happy. God's end in all things is his own glory, his fame that he should be manifested, known, admired, adored. This statement is true, but it's incomplete. It needs to be balanced by recognition that through setting his love on men, God has voluntarily bound up his own final happiness in theirs. God's happiness will not be complete till his beloved ones are finally out of trouble. God was happy without man before man was made. He would have continued happy had he simply destroyed man after man had sinned. But as it is, He has set his love upon particular sinners. And this means that by his own voluntary choice, he will not know perfect and unmixed happiness again till he has brought every one of them to heaven. He has in effect resolved that from now on for all eternity, his happiness shall be conditional upon ours. Thus God saves not only for his own glory, but also for his gladness. The thought passes understanding and almost beggars belief. If you're in Christ, your future is sure, it is secure, and thirdly, my future is at home with the Lord forever. Psalm 23 and verse 6 ends with the words, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. If you had a good home growing up, you'll know the joy of home. If you didn't have a good home, then you also know the deep, deep pain and perhaps even abuse of home. In some sense, we look away from our home and we look to this home. And this is something significant and special about home. It doesn't matter where you travel or what you do. There's just kind of like the GPS is always just set for home. And when you come home, there is a, there is a joy, there is a, there is a peace, there is a comfort. It's the end of, of every adventure, every journey is home. You can Google the synonyms for home. I found like 50 synonyms when you think of every kind of animal's home has a different name and every kind of place that you stay, whether at sea or on land, or it has a name because there's something special about home. And for David, the house of the Lord is not just a reference to the temple. For sure, there were times David says, oh, I long to be in God's house in that sense. But David is saying, actually, This temple is just a pointer to the reality of God. It's God's presence I long for. It's it's that I don't want to be separate from God. Heaven will only be heaven if you want the presence of Christ. All the other things are just an add-on. And so I believe David is pointing ultimately to the place where God's sheep will be taken finally home after death to dwell with the Lord forever. And Psalm 23 has been all about movement. There's been lying down, there's been standing up, there's been wandering away, there's been brought back, there's been going up, there's been going down, there's been fears, there's been irritations, there's been movement, there's been all of this walking and leading. But now the sheep are being led down this mountain, back home to these familiar folds, back home. Security, safety. No longer nomads on the move who don't really have a home, exposed to the elements, now safe, the enemy outside, no longer in the presence of those enemies, dwelling and resting. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, 
not built by human hands. The passage that Kate read earlier from Jesus, John 14. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back and take you to be with me so that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where we're going. And then Thomas the disciple said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You know what staggers my mind as we come to the end of the psalm? Is that many shepherds will bring their sheep off the mountains and they'll bring them home to the folds at the end of the day. But I've never heard of a shepherd who invites their sheep to come and live right inside the house with him. That is a staggering, staggering picture of grace. The shepherd has invited your sheep to come and live right inside his home forever. The intimacy, the exuberant love and grace of our Lord. Maybe you've heard of this couple. Their name is Jackie and Mark Tressel. And they invited their 600 kilogram horse, Misha, to come and live in their house with them. Maybe you've seen it. They've even written a book about it. And of course, they live in the US. That's why we keep talking about the strange stories there. But they wrote a book about it. And the book's entitled, Who Ever Heard of a Horse in a House? What a lovely title. Who Ever Heard of a Horse in a House? Well, that's Misha. And she enjoys her own porch. They built a little swinging door so that she can help out in the kitchen. She watches television. They have this giant couch. Sometimes she stands on the couch. Sometimes she manages to sit down on the couch, and she literally watches TV. She spends 12 hours a day inside the house. They have the bath filled right to the brim, and she slurps all of her water out of the bath. She knows which bath to go to. She's made herself at home. Misha even eats off the same kitchen table using the same plates and utensils as them. And her favorite foods are donuts, spaghetti, and pies. This is Misha. And I look at those people and I think, hmm, something not so lacquer there. I don't know. Seems crazy. It seems very off the wall. And especially for somebody like me, I'm not the best animal lover in the world. And my girls begged me for years, Dad, please, can we get dogs? Please, can we get dogs? So I said, all right, well, if ants are not good enough for you, and they're really small, and they won't really bother me. Actually, ants do bother me, but that's another, for another sermon. I said, what is the smallest dogs we can get? And so we got two little Yorkies. And uh, they're actually more like cats. They stay inside. They sleep in their bed every night. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think I've kind of been able to cope with just two small, small dogs. That's, that's enough for me. But when we think about a horse, a 600 kilogram horse in a house, what's going on there? But to ask that question, why, is to ask of God, God, why would you have a sheep in your house? A dirty, smelly sheep. Why would the Lord Jesus Christ eat with sinners? Why would he go into a sinner's house? Why would he transform that individual's heart? Why would he train them in righteousness, make them new? So that they do things that they never thought were possible, almost beyond their sheep nature, because he's inside them. Why does he love you so much? Are you holy? Have you cleaned up your act and your own strength? Have you met all your New Year's resolutions? Have you kept all the goals you've ever set? No, you're not holy. Do you deserve such treatment? No, but he makes a way for you to come in out of the cold and he says, no, even my sheep pen out here is not good enough. I want you in my house. Flock, come. It doesn't matter what you bump into. It doesn't matter what you disturb. I want you to come with full access, all rights. Everything I have is yours, and this is your home, safe and secure. The gospel is astounding with its access and privileges. And so Psalm 23 ends where it began. It began with the Lord as my shepherd, and it ends with dwelling in the house of the Lord forever. And we've really said nothing new. Every week we have just said the same thing. The Lord is my shepherd, but just in different ways. And so I have to ask again, do you know him? If you don't know him, this will not be your future. Come, trust Christ, turn to him. Be sure that you can say surely. If you have any doubt in your heart, come and say surely. I want to be sure. I want to be sure that I could say, surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever because your entire future depends on it. As I close, I want to share with you a kind of a, an image that I had a number of years ago as I stood 
in the arrivals lounge at OR Tambo. It's quite a big area. You can't really even call it a, a lounge. I don't know what you call it. It's just that, and you know what international arrivals is like if you've been there. And my wife, Liesl, had been on the REC missions trip to the Philippines. And uh, we as a family had been without her. We had suffered greatly. Uh, you know, she's our shepherd when the Lord's not our shepherd. Uh, so when she goes away, yeah. Um, and so I was there with the girls and craning my neck. You know, those, uh, those opaque sliding glass doors open and people come through and then they close again and you sort of wonder what's on the, on the other side if you've never traveled much. And uh, craning my neck, where is Liesl, where is she? And as I looked around, I recognized that this arrivals lounge wasn't like it normally is. It was packed with people because it was three days before Christmas. There were people with banners and people with balloons waiting for loved ones from all over the globe to arrive for Christmas. And I stood there and I got so filled with emotion watching as a door would open and somebody would come through and seeing the response. For some people there was cheering. And I said to myself, Lord, could this be a picture of what the arrivals lounge in heaven looks like? Because the door would open and I saw family coming in with grandchildren and here were the grandparents and they ran to embrace them. I heard the shout of a little girl, Granny! And uh, jumping into the air in these loving arms, catching and embracing. I saw uh, two lovers running to each other, embracing each other, just holding each other. And you wonder, at what cost had they got there? How long had they been apart? And they were just tears streaming down their face and they were together, together once more. What will it be like for us when we walk through the misted doors of death? Having traveled so far, some of you having paid a great cost, some of our brothers and sisters in this world who are persecuted paying a far greater cost for their flight than we ever have, but behind that a Lord who has paid the greatest cost of all. Alexander McLaren, the old commentator, says the sheep are led by many a way, Sometimes through sweet meadows, and then I know for even some of you, sometimes limping along sharp, flinted, dusty highways, and that's some of you. Sometimes high up over rough, rocky mountain passes, sometimes down through deep gorges, with no sunshine in their gloom, but they are ever being led to one place. And when the hot day is over and they're gathered into one fold and the sinking sun sees them safe, where no wolf can come nor any robber climb up anymore. All shall rest forever under the shepherd's eye. Then the sweet psalm shall have reached its highest fulfillment. For then they shall hunger no more, neither shall they thirst any more, neither shall the sun beat upon them, nor any heat, for the lamb which is in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd." book of Revelation, will be their shepherd. He's a shepherd to the end and shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters and God shall wipe all tears from their eyes. Friend, how do we imagine what it will be like when those doors open and we finally step into a new country that we haven't quite experienced before? What will the joy be like of being flung into the air by loved ones who know and love the Lord Jesus Christ, who've passed on long before us, who are waiting for us in that lounge to welcome us home? And then I want to point you further. Look past them. Can you see him standing there, your shepherd, the one that you've loved all of your life, but you've never seen him face to face. You've only followed from behind. You've only seen glimpses of him from a distance. It's only been his rod of, of the word of God and the staff of the spirit by which you've been able to experience him. You've had to behold him dimly through the eye of faith and only the back of his goodness has passed before you. And yes, you've prayed to him. You've worshiped him countless times. You've cried out to him. You've sacrificed for him. You've loved him. You've served him, but you've not yet seen him face to face. But now the doors have opened. You've passed through. The journey is over. He says it is finished. And as the good shepherd turns towards you and you see him face to face, he says to you, my child, welcome home. Welcome home.